Welcome to our commencement uh, for the Goldman School of Public Policy. Welcome to uh, faculty, students, uh, staff who uh, have done a tremendous amount to make all this possible, not just this event, but to make possible the success we have as a school and to make possible the success of our graduates. Uh, and welcome to, of course, the family, friends, and most of all, the class of 2013. Uh, my name is Henry Brady. I'm the Dean of the Golden School of Public Policy. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, as I said, this is just a wonderful day with wonderful weather outside. Uh, a bit of a commotion out there because they have the main commencement going on in the stadium. So it was uh, lots going on. Very exciting. I want to, first of all, just say a few facts about today. Uh, we think this is the first class in many years to have every graduating MPP student attend the commencement, and that's wonderful. Thank you. It's great to have you all here. We have four PhD students who have made it through the PhD program. Yes. And, and there's lots of great things to be said uh, about this class, but one interesting thing is that we've had probably more media involvement uh, in this class than we've had with any class ever before. Uh, a bunch of the students were involved in Jennifer Granholm's uh, current TV show and helping her to put together the show. And where's Jen there's Jennifer, okay. Former governor of Michigan uh, and who had the current TV, uh, The War Room with Jennifer Granholm. And so a bunch of students did that, which I think is great because it means that they've learned a lot about the media and hopefully can not only do good policy analysis, but can also find ways to bring that policy analysis to fruition by dealing with the sometimes difficult to deal with media. Uh, but in addition to that, we've had a bunch of students who have published op-eds on topics such as I'll read the titles. Sequestration cuts and their effects on Head Start. Universal early childhood edge. And you should raise your hand for the persons who've done this. So who did the sequestration cuts? Somebody, okay, somebody did. Universal early childhood education. Challenging federal gun laws in the state of Alaska. I, I, I knew that was you. <laughs> That's our Alaska. We actually have two Alaskans, I think, but that's one of our two Alaskans. We're very proud. Um, and hydraulic fracturing best practices. Okay. And federal investment in the state of California. So I really do think this is an ex extraordinary thing to have our students not only know how to do policy analysis, but also how to, to deal with the media. Um, many of you have heard me say again and again, Goldman School is about three things. It's about excellence, it's about mission, and it's about community. Excellence is, of course, absolutely fundamental and important. Uh, we train our students so that they really know the best techniques for analyzing public policy. And as I've heard students say, and this is the thing we're always so happy to hear as they go along, they say, you know, I always had a sense that I cared about public policy, and I always knew I really wanted to make changes but now I have a better sense of really what things will work and what things won't work. And so I think that's a really fundamental thing that we train our students in economics and statistics and quantitative methods and in politics and in management and in leadership so that they can actually come up with policies that will work and will make a difference and not just policies that sound good but actually aren't gonna work. And that's so important in today's world, where we have a world in which people don't trust government, uh, sadly. Uh, they, I just saw a poll recently that said, in fact, that if you have communities which have privatized some of their services, and when you go and ask people uh, about those services, if they like the results, they say, well, it was because the private sector is doing it, even, by the way, in some communities where the public sector is still delivering the services. And if they dislike the results, they're sure it must be government delivering the services. And so, even when government's doing a good job, people can't believe that it's doing a good job. So we've got to do better, uh, first of all, just have better policies, but we also got to do a better job in, in explaining to people what government does and why it's important. And that gets me back to the media point, why that's so important. So we have excellence. We also have mission. And that's partly generated by our students. 
who come with such tremendous devotions to trying to make the world a better place. It's one of the thrilling things about having this 80 odd students, 80 odd, well, 80 <laughs> students, some of them are odd, but wonderfully so. And having these students who come with such a sense of mission, um, most of them have worked for several years and accomplished great things already. Uh, that's one way we select them into the program because we want people who really do have a sense of mission and a sense they want to change the world. And we think our tremendous value added, as I've already indicated, is that we actually train them to think about how to do things right and better and to make sure that they're coming up with the right choices and not the wrong choices. So excellence, mission, and then the third thing I think we create among our classes and at our school is a sense of community. And this is important to me as dean. Uh, I don't want to be at a place where community is unimportant, where it's sort of cutthroat, and where there's not a sense that we're all in this together and we're trying to make the world a better place together. And I think we work very hard, and I think we succeed in creating a sense of community. It's partly in our architecture. At the end of this, you will have a reception over at our school, and you will see, if you haven't seen already, uh, our wonderful old building, our wonderful new building, the plot of land in between. Uh, which actually provides a sort of mini campus for the Goldman School of Public Policy, a place where the other day when the first year students finished their exams, they were out frolicking on that lawn. Uh, and that was just wonderful. I thought to myself, isn't this nice? They feel this is the place when they're unwinding from a series of grueling exams that they're going to sit there and throw a football around and drink beer and, and, and do other things. They were lying on the grass. They were, they were having fun. And it's also the fact that the living room is right outside my office. I don't think there's many schools where the dean walks right out of his office, sometimes can't walk right out of his office because it's blocked by students who are sitting there at tables working at their computers or by electrical cords going every which way uh, so that I'm liable to trip. But nevertheless, that's wonderful because I walk out of my office and here are all these students talking about public policy, about politics. Uh, I had a distinguished visitor in my office recently. He was a university professor at Harvard, and he was in my office working with me, and then he walked into the living room um, to, to go to the, the men's room, actually, and then as he came back, he said, I can't believe it. It said, it's so wonderful to walk through the living room and get snippets of conversation and hear what they're talking about. One table, it's people talking about economics and supply and demand curves and what's the right way to tax something to make sure that you actually get the right amount of it. And you go to the next table, they're talking about politics. You go to the next table, it's some public policy issue. And that's what you get as you walk through the living room. And so I feel as dean that every time I walk through that living room, I'm just energized by it all. I say, this is the place I want to be. This is what I want to be doing, because it's so wonderful to see these uh, young people uh, talking about these things, thinking about these things, and trying to figure out how to make the world a better place. So we have excellence, mission, and community. And those things are what's most important to me. And let me say what I think that all comes together to, to produce. I just came back from a trip to China, and we met with some people who were, who were not in our MPP program. They were in our executive programs where we train executives, in this case, from Hong Kong. And we were talking with some of them, and the word that came up again and again from the training they'd had at the, the Goldman School was, coming to Berkeley, to the Goldman School, gave me courage. And I was really struck by that, because I thought, oh gosh, they could have said analytical techniques. You know, they could have said it gave me a little better knowledge of public policy. But what they thought was, because we do those things. <laughs> but what they said was courage. And I think that's maybe, I hope we've given you courage. Because I believe, when I was a kid, I had a Davy Crockett hat. And Davy Crockett's motto was, be sure you're right, then go ahead. Older people in the audience may remember that. Nobody else will. Um, but be sure you're right, then go ahead. Well, I'm not sure you can ever be absolutely sure you're right. But, but with good analysis, you can be much sure you are right. And that analysis can form the basis for having courage to say, no, I really think this is the right thing to do. And so we talked to one member who had gone through our executive programs. And uh, he was a doctor. 
And he said he, before he had come to Berkeley, he had known that his job was to follow orders and he was hired by the Taiwanese government to run a, a medical facility. But when he got back, he thought, there's more to my job than that. My job involves having the courage to say what the right thing to do is and making sure I do it. And this became important because he runs, as part of his medical facility, the last leper colony in Taiwan called Losheng. You can look it up on the internet. It's quite a story. And by, when he went back, the Taiwanese government decided to build a subway through Losheng. And he had the courage to say, no, we can't do that to these people who have had very difficult lives, who have had lives racked by pain, and of course, lives of terrible isolation, because let's face it, leprosy is the being a leper. That's about isolation. And he said, I have to protect them. And he found a way to do that. And his claim to us, and it was a wonderful claim, was that we had helped give him the courage to do that. So I'm saying to each and every one of you, use your analytical schools, skills, and use your sense of mission and I hope your community to make sure that you always have the courage to do the things that are the right things to do. And I think if you act that way and you have the courage and the audacity to do that, you'll live better lives, the world will be a better place, and you'll feel really great about what you've done. So that's my message today is courage. And I hope we've given you some of that. That would be the greatest gift we could have given you. So with that, uh, let me just say uh, thank you to all the families, and spouses, partners, children, friends, all of you who have supported our students. We really appreciate it. We know it's a tough program. We know there are moments when our students need support. We know that you've, pro I'm pointing over the heads of the <laughs> graduates, we know that you have provided that and we thank you for it. Um, and. That's part of what makes our school great is the support groups that our students come with. So thank you to everybody out there on behalf of our graduates. Now to our graduates. Through your hard work and determination, you've successfully completed your degree. Some of you maybe last night knowing the way these things go. Some of you may be this morning. <laughs> Some of you may be still writing your APAs. I don't know, as you sit there. Um, you're joining a community of GSBP alums more than 1,800 strong, all of whom have a common bond, the Goldman School of Public Policy. As the newest group of alumni, we look forward to all the, and this is another wonderful thing about being Dean, seeing what you go out and do. It's amazing, it's wonderful, it's terrific. And so I really look forward to hearing you as you go on in your lives, hearing from you, and hearing about what you've been doing. So that, with that, congratulations and good luck to the class of 2013. Now let me uh, introduce the alumni speaker. Uh, you're soon to be an alum. Uh, Jackie Bender, uh, class of 2011, will say a few words on behalf of the Alumni Association. She's currently an analyst with the California Association of Public Hospitals and Health Systems in Oakland, a really important area where lots is happening in California and in across the United States. Uh, her group is a nonprofit trade organization working to strengthen the capacity of its member hospital systems to advance community health, ensure access to comprehensive, high quality, culturally sensitive healthcare services, and educate the next generation of healthcare professionals. Jackie, Lee, cur Jackie currently serves as one of the co chairs of the GSBP Alumni Association Board of Directors. Jackie Bender. Thank you, Dean Brady. It was just two years ago that I sat right down there where you are. And like you, I had just come out of an amazing experience. 
of wonderful professors, policy soulmates, wonderful talent shows and writing funny skits, and newfound lifelong friendships. So now, two years after graduating, I'm back here to welcome you. Welcome to your life after graduation. <laughs> welcome to your nine to five job. Welcome to bosses and commutes. And welcome to that blank stare when you say, you know, this solution just isn't Pareto efficient. <laughs> But it gets worse. <laughs> After graduating, we realized that we weren't just sad that school was over. We were depressed. Depressed because we were all about to go to different jobs and different cities and different countries. And these were the last days that we were going to spend together. It was the end of our just found community. but we found new ways to stay connected. We started a policy salon with some of our classmates so that we could get together every few months over dinner and talk about the latest policy topics like drones or housing or pensions. In our new jobs, we've created opportunities for current students by finding IPAs and APAs and internships and jobs which you all know are so hard to find, so we're working on creating them for you. <laughs> we volunteer our time to advise current and prospective students. And sometimes we even give money. <laughs> all this to say that you can, you can actually skip the depression part. <laughs> and from my experience, being part of the alumni community, helping current students, and continuing the policy debate this will all help you on your way. So now, even though we're in different jobs, in different cities, in different countries, our friendships have become stronger, our policy discussions deeper, and our dedication to policy stronger than ever before. My name is Jackie Bender, and on behalf of the Goldman School of Public Policy Alumni Association Board of Directors and my co-chair, Stuart, Stuart Drown, welcome to the Alumni Association, and congratulations to the class of 2013. It is now my pleasure to invite Sean LaGuardia to the stage, who... He was selected as one of two speakers by the class of 2013. Sean. Uh, good morning. So uh, this will be the first time I publicly address this class uh, with a clear mind. But before I get serious, I have a few thank yous that I want to uh, dole out. First and foremost, thank you to the staff at the Goldman School for organizing this ceremony. <laughs> and for providing all the support along the way. During an enthralling lecture on Z-scores, Jack Glazer quipped, we stand on the shoulders of nerds. <laughs> Today, Martha, Jalila, Cecile, Kari, to the faculty and staff, for the past two years, and especially today, these nerds stand on your shoulders. I want to thank my parents for bringing half the Philippines here today. If you had trouble finding a seat, I apologize. <laughs> my parents have waited 20, more than 28 years to uh, show me off to their siblings. And I won't be bearing them any children, so this is as close as they're going to get to being proud of me. It's a joke, Mom. <laughs> I also want to thank the other parents who came today. Thank you for raising some, oh, I'm sorry, thank you for raising some of the best friends a man can ever have. But most especially, we all thank you for enduring the burdensome duty 
of having to answer the same question at every dinner party you've attended in the past two years. And that question is no other than, what is a master's in public policy? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, government and policy. What I tell my friends is that Bob Reich teaches here, and that's all that, 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 that works. <laughs> While I cannot exactly define what an MPP is, I know the reason why we all came to this school. Because there are very few people who are willing and able to fight the good fight. Some of you gave up lucrative careers or careers that you loved because you felt that two years here would make you able to have an even larger impact on our world. You saw the widening chasm between what we hold dear as Americans and, between, and the current state of affairs. And you've committed yourself to the work of building the bridge between those two. You came here to give a voice to those who could not speak for themselves. You came here to protect the most vulnerable and to heal an ailing planet. Over the past two years, you have shown a level of commitment to public service and serving others that I had only previously seen from one other person, and that is my grandmother. My grandmother sparked my commitment to public service not because she held any high-level positions or had a master's degree, but because she loved all human beings unconditionally, no matter their past and no matter the number of times she may have been disappointed in them. She served others not in self-interest and not for money. She served others despite the financial constraints or the physical toll that it took upon her aging body. And she inspired and touched a great number of people. The degree we receive today is valuable to us, yes, but, it is, but we must also remember that it is more valuable to the people who we strive to serve on a day-to-day -day basis after this. There is one last thank you I would like to give, and that is to no other than all of the members of this graduating class. You, rem you may remember these autobiographical sketches that we filled out prior to our orientation. Upon reading this from cover to cover two years ago, my heart sank because I could not help but ask myself how I weaseled my way into a class as talented and as smart as this. For example, Jeff Belisario's read, and if I didn't have a cap, I would puff my hair up like this. This is my Jeff voice. Much of my investment work involved the analysis of government regulation and its impacts on the energy, food, and healthcare industries. Contrast this to mine, which read, if I didn't care about my health, my primary diet would consist of cheese, dark beer, and chocolate. <laughs> Jeff turned out to be an all right guy. <laughs> Reading these sketches, I could not have foreseen the best friends that you, would have co that you come to be, nor the fact that these two years have been the most fun and most formative in my life. The highlight, of my many, the highlight of my many days was being able to sit in the living room. I would lie to you and tell you I had office hours or I was waiting for a meeting. But in truth, I spent so much time in that room at the good chance I could sit in on some enlightened conversation or to laugh with you about the absurdity of our lives at GSPP. I was lucky to grow up in a home where I was told I was important and smart and beautiful on a daily basis. Somewhere in high school and as an undergraduate, I managed to lose my faith in these affirmations. And my biggest fear about coming to graduate school was that my classmates might agree. You refused to let me doubt myself or to belittle myself, celebrated me for who I am, and helped me gain a self-confidence that, that was otherwise non-existent. I love you because you taught me to love myself. No amount of student debt or foregone income could equal the value of the lesson I would incur <laughs> could equal the value of this lesson. And I would incur all these costs again if it meant that we could change the world from a little building atop Hearst Avenue. You have changed my life, and now it's time for us all to change a vast many more. Thank you, GSPP, from the bottom of my heart. Congratulations to the class of 2013. <laughs> Bad. It is, my, it is my privilege to introduce to you the second of the student speakers chosen by this graduating class, a man who inspires us with his choice words during economics lectures, 
and with his stunning dance moves every weekend, the one, the only, Andrew Bordonado. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in support of the Goldman School of Public Policy graduating class of 2013. We sincerely appreciate you all being here for us. Thank you to the faculty and the staff at the Goldman School for nurturing us over these past two years. Also, thank you to all the friends and family, near and far, for being important influences on our lives and leading us here today. It is my distinct honor to address you all on this fine day in celebration of a wonderful cohort of human beings and future policymakers. I was underwater when I first contemplated going to public policy school. A few years ago, I worked as a legislative aide at the Hawaii State Senate, where I worked toward passing legislation that would provide political representation for the native Hawaiian people and provide for civil unions. My time at the Senate, however, was not entirely fruitful. In a single day, both of these efforts, for which I had spent more than two years working on, failed to overcome the opposition and died on the Senate floor. This setback meant that the Native Hawaiians would continue to be silenced in their own land and that people like me might never have our love recognized. The only way I knew how to cope with this loss was to be out in the ocean Far out, I swam far out in hopes that the water would wash away my pain. Instead, while I was floating, a sudden wave sucked me underwater and hurled me through the white wash. It is impossible to beat the current, so rather than fight it and swim to the surface, I surrendered to the ocean. As I lay underwater, I wondered if there was any meaning whatsoever in fighting for social justice. And we're all but subjects to the ebb and flow of the social current. Eventually, the ocean let me go, but not without first throwing me against a rock where I cut my lip. As I slinked out of the water, I rubbed the taste of blood from my mouth, and I could only think about how bitter this earth is. In search of a way to gain the tools I need to push back against the current, I decided to pursue the path toward public policy. When I arrived at the Goldman School, I was overjoyed to see that, exce that exceedingly brilliant people surrounded me, and that all of us were united by the belief that whenever any person anywhere in this world is denied fundamental rights or marginalized in any way, it diminishes, it diminishes us all. The Goldman School does not merely graduate policymakers, but policy pioneers. From the Goldman School class of 2013, the policy, there are policy pioneers who will deliver social impact bonds to lift up communities, policy pioneers who will bring affordable renewable energy sources to market, policy pioneers that will fix the criminal justice system so that it focuses on rehabilitating lives rather than ending them, Policy pioneers who will democratize the allocation of public resources through participatory budgeting. Policy pioneers who will engineer microfinance schemes to sustainably end poverty in developing countries. Policy pioneers who will bridge the IT divide. Policy pioneers who will clean, bring clean water technologies to the poorest of countries. Policy pioneers who will find a way for dedicated immigrants to earn US citizenship and policy pioneers who will ensure that children of all social classes are given high-quality educational resources and teachers. <laughs> These efforts are but a few examples of the work that my colleagues will accomplish in the future. I've had the rare pleasure of being surrounded by genuine individuals who I strongly believe will affect substantive change in this world. During these past two years, 
My Goldman colleagues and I have struggled through problem sets together, written policy briefs together, organized symposiums together, produced an academic journal together, traveled together, and my favorite activity, twerked it so hard on the dance floor, <laughs> we caused tornadoes together. <laughs> Thank you all for being nothing short of my family to me these past two years. I truly love you all. The thought of being separated from my GSPP family is unbearable, but I know given the unbreakable connections we have formed together here at GSPP, that next time I find myself underwater, I can call on any of you. The same forces that brought us to Goldman will keep us connected forever. I leave you all with one final anecdote. Recently, I went to a farming village called Menadipet in India to work on my advanced policy analysis project. There, I worked with several rural Indian farmers who are capable of growing only very little and lack the access to the finance needed to improve their crop yield. Seemingly entrenched in intergenerational poverty, I wondered why they worked so hard and suffered so much for nearly nothing. I thought of how bitter their existence must be. Until I countered a remarkable female farmer who spearheaded a local farmers cooperative that lobbies banks to deliver microfinance to the poorest of rural farmers. She remarked to me that, Every life has the potential for many lives. If I can imagine a better life, it is achievable. In the same vein, if we as policy pioneers can imagine a more dignified life for others, we can definitely imagine and substantively develop the means to achieve that aim. My time with you all at the Goldman School has shown me that it is possible with the right combination of passion and knowledge to rise up against the current. I'm further imbued with a belief that I hope all of us will carry forward. That this, that as bitter as this, as this earth may be, it is capable of bearing such sweet fruit. Thank you. I'm Daniel Kamen, a professor in the policy school, and I'd just like to, to comment on what we just heard. The passion, the desire to get things done, the mix of tools to make policy happen, and the con conviction to follow those is what you just heard in those last comments, and that's really what the school is all about. We're fortunate enough today to have a commencement speaker who embodies that, who has lived that on many levels. When I think about what a graduation speech should be, it should be intellectually challenging, inspiring, and at least a little bit irreverent. And I think you'll get all of those in today's speaker. Amory Lovins started his undergraduate career at Harvard, moved to Oxford, became a Don at Oxford, has, as of this afternoon, will have 12 different honorary degrees. He co-founded the Rocky Mountain Institute, his list of awards are, is phenomenally long, from the MacArthur Genius Prize to the World Technology Award, the Right Livelihood Award, the Blue Planet Award, um, the Time Hero of the Year. They go on and on, and they're all deserved. In fact, the students here who have taken my Energy and Society class, a course title that pushes the boundaries a little bit on including all one and together, will, will know that the only paper that we've read every year for 20 years, both at the beginning of the class and frequently on the final exam, is Amory's paper, Soft Energy Paths, that remains the most inspiring and the most brilliant piece of work on energy I've ever seen. It lays out new analytic techniques. It changed the course of planning around energy infrastructure in developed and developing economies. And it changes how we think about what's possible on the energy frontier. All of those things you'll get in Amory's comments today. It's a remarkable achievement to bring all those things together. 
at the Rocky Mountain Institute, which he co-founded and is now the, 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 the chief um, uh, academic intellectual officer, Amory has inspired a generation of students, of colleagues, of government leaders. He's briefed over 25 heads of state. He is a, like myself, a recovering physicist, although I hope not recovering too far on occasion. And what I think you'll hear today is exactly what the kind of policy inspiring work and policy inspired work that we've heard, and that is a speaker who will bring you rigor without the mortise. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I've never found it uh, that it works very well to try to depress people into action, so let me tell you a story. The early bioneer Bill McClarney was stirring a, a big vat of algae in his Costa Rica research center when a brassy North American lady strode in. What she demanded was he doing, stirring a vat of green goo, and what really matters in the world was love. So Bill said, well, there's theoretical love, and then there's applied love, <laughs> and he kept on stirring. So many of us here stir and strive in a spirit of applied hope. We work to make the world better, not from some airy theoretical hope, but in the pragmatic and grounded conviction that starting with hope and acting out of hope can cultivate a different kind of world worth being hopeful about, reinforcing itself in a virtuous spiral. So applied hope is not about some vague far-off future, but it is expressed and created moment by moment through our choices. Francis Moore LePay said, hope is a stance, not an assessment. But applied hope is not mere glandular optimism. The optimist treats the future as fate, not choice, and thus fails to take responsibility for making the world we want. In that sense, uh, optimism and pessimism, as, as my old mentor Dave Brower taught, are different sides of the same irresponsible surrender to fatalism. Applied hope is a deliberate choice of heart and head. David Orr says the optimist has his feet up on the desk and a satisfied smirk knowing the deck is stacked, while the person living in hope has her sleeves rolled up and is fighting hard to uh, change or beat the odds. Optimism can easily mask cowardice. Applied hope requires fearlessness. Now, fear of specific and avoidable dangers has evolutionary value. Nobody has ancestors who were not mindful of saber-toothed tigers. But pervasive dread promoted by some who wish to keep us pickled in fear is numbing and demotivating. When I give a talk, sometimes someone details in a question period the many bad things happening in the world and all the suffering in the universe, uh, and asks, how dare I propose solutions? Isn't resistance futile? And the only response I found is to ask as gently as I can, yeah, I can see um, why you feel that way. Does it make you more effective? I recently was um, teaching a college class in which one young woman was bemoaning so many global problems that she'd lost all hope and she couldn't imagine bringing a child into such a world. But when we discussed it, it quickly became clear to both of us that she hadn't lost hope at all. She knew exactly where she'd left it. The most Solid foundation for feeling better about the future is, of course, to improve it tangibly, durably, reproducibly, scalably. So now's the time to be practitioners, not theorists, to be synthesis, not specialists, to do solutions, not problems, to do transformation, not incrementalism. 
or as my mentor Edwin Land said, don't undertake a problem unless it is manifestly important and nearly impossible. So it's time to shift our language and action, as my wife Judy says, from somebody should to I will. To do real work on real projects and to go to scale, as that early activist St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. <laughs> In a world short of both hope and time, we need to practice uh, Raymond Williams' truth that to be truly radical is to make hope possible, not despair convincing. Uh, well, hope becomes possible, practical, even profitable when, for example, advanced resource efficiency turns scarcity into plenitude. David White has a poem called Loaves and Fishes, capturing that goal in this way. He said, this is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. Forget the news and the radio and the blurred screen. This is the time of loaves and fishes. People are hungry, and one good word is bread for a thousand. So, with the world so finely balanced between fear and hope, with the outcome in suspense and a whiff of imminent shift in the air, let us choose to add the small stubborn ounces of our weight on the side of applied hope. As Zen master Goto Roshi said, infinite gratitude toward all things past infinite service to all things present, infinite responsibility to all things future. Now, this mission is challenging. It requires you to combine a sizzle in your brain and a fire in your belly, perseverance rooted like a redwood, soul as light as a butterfly. According to the internet, when Michael C. Muhammad apparently said or wrote, Everything works out right in the end. If things are not working right, it's not the end yet. Don't let it bother you. Relax and keep on going. So in this tranquil but unwavering spirit of applied hope, let me tell you another story. This is from the early 50s when the Dayak people in Borneo had malaria and the World Health Organization had a solution. They would spray DDT everywhere. And they did, and the mosquitoes died, the malaria declined. So far, so good. But there were side effects, which uh, Garrett Hardin said are the things you didn't think of whose existence you will deny as long as possible. For example, the house roofs started to fall down on people's heads because it turned out the DDT had also killed teensy little parasitic wasps that had e earlier controlled the thatch-eating caterpillars, which then proliferated and munched up the roof thatching. So the colonial government addressed this problem by giving everybody sheet metal roofs, but then people were driven nuts by lack of sleep because of the noise of the tropical rain on the tin roofs at night. And meanwhile, the DDT poisoned bugs were eaten by geckos, which were eaten by cats. So the DDT built up in the food chain and killed the cats. But without the cats, the rats flourished and multiplied, and soon the World Health Organization was threatened with potential outbreaks of typhus and sylvatic plague, which it would itself have created. And they therefore had to call in the British Royal Air Force from Singapore to conduct Operation Cat Drop, parachuting, by some accounts, 14,000 live cats into Borneo. I am not making this up. I couldn't make this up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this story, our guiding parable at Rocky Mountain Institute, shows that if you don't understand how things are connected, quite often the cause of problems is solutions. Most of today's big problems are like that. But we can instead harness hidden connections so the cause of solutions is solutions. So we can solve or better still avoid a problem in a way that also solves or better still avoids many other problems without making new ones to go, you know, before somebody has to go parachuting more cats. So join me a minute in envisaging where these linked multiplying solutions can lead if you apply and extend what you've learned here and take responsibility for creating the world you want. 
And by the way, details of this business-led future as it relates to energy are, are worked out in a book called Reinventing Fire, uh, which we published in 2011. And uh, through tenacious transformation, we're helping take it there. So what does that future look like? Well, imagine a world a few short generations hence where spacious, peppy, ultra-safe, 125 to 240 mile a gallon equivalent cars whisper through revitalized cities and towns, convivial suburbs, and fertile, prosperous countryside burning no oil and emitting pure drinking water or nothing at all. Where sprawl is no longer mandated or subsidized, so stronger families eat better food on front porches and kids free of obesity and diabetes and asthma play in thriving neighborhoods, where new buildings and plugged-in parked cars produce enough surplus energy to power the now efficient old buildings, and where buildings make people healthier, happier, and more productive, creating delight when entered, serenity when occupied, and regret when departed. Imagine a world where oil and coal and nuclear energy have all been phased out, all vanquished by the competitors whose lower costs and risks have already enabled them to capture most of the world's market for new electrical services, energy efficiency, distributed renewables, combined heat and power, and optionally by small amounts of advanced biofuels that use no cropland and move carbon from air to tilth where it belongs. Where resilient, right-sized energy systems make major failures impossible, not inevitable. Where the collapse of oil's demand and price has defunded enemies, undermined dictatorship and corruption, and doused the Mideast tinderbox. Where our advanced economy is no longer fueled at all by the rotted remains of primeval swamp goo and dinosaur dung. Where energy policy is no longer a gloomy multiple choice test. Uh, do you prefer to die of A, climate change, B, oil wars, C, nuclear holocaust? Uh, D, all of the above. Uh, we choose E, none of the above. Imagine, therefore, a world where carbon emissions have long been steadily declining at a handsome profit because saving fuel is cheaper than buying fuel. Where global climate has stabilized and repair has begun, and where this planetary near-death experience has finally made antisocial and unacceptable the arrogance that let cleverness imperil the whole human prospect by outrunning wisdom. Imagine a world where the successful industries, rather than wasting 99.98% of their materials, follow the late Racy Anderson's lead. They take nothing, waste nothing, and do no harm. Where the cost of waste is driving unnatural capitalism extinct. Where service providers and their customers prosper by doing more and better with less for longer. So products become ever more efficient to make and to use. Where integrative engineering and biomimicry create abundance by design. And where elegant frugality turns scarcities and conflicts about energy, water, food, land, minerals into enough for all, forever. Imagine a world where the war against the earth is over where we've stopped treating soil like dirt. Forests are expanding. Farms emulate natural ecosystems. Rivers run clean. Oceans are starting to recover. Fish and wildlife are returning. And a stabilizing, radically resource-efficient human population needs ever less of the world's land and metabolism, leaving more for all the relatives who give us life. Imagine a world where we don't just know more, we also know better. Where overspecialization and reductionism have gone from thrillingly fashionable to unaffordably foolish. Where Darwin finally beats Descartes. Where vision across boundaries triumphs simply because it works better and costs less. Imagine a world secure, free from fear of privation or attack, where conflict prevention is as normal as fire prevention, 
where conflicts not avoided are peacefully resolved through th strengthened international laws, norms, and institutions, where threatened aggression is reliably deterred or defeated by non-provocative defense that makes others feel and be more secure, not less, where all people can be nourished, healthy, and educated, and where all know Dr. King's truth that peace is not the absence of war, it is the presence of justice. Imagine a world where reason, diversity, tolerance, and democracy are once more ascendant, where economic and religious fundamentalism are obsolete, where tyranny is odious, rare, failing, and dwindling, and where global consciousness has transcended fear to live and strive in hope in applied hope. This is the astonishing world we are all gradually creating together. It's being built before our eyes by many of you and a myriad other world weavers. Brains as Gifford Alibba Pinchot remind us are evenly distributed, one per person. Thus, most of the world's brains are in the South, half are in the heads of women, most are in the heads of poor people. As an emerging global nervous system and millions of new civil society organizations start to knit together this collective intelligence, the most powerful thing we know in the universe, innovation and collaboration are starting to overcome stagnation and squabbles. The search for intelligent life on Earth continues, but as we all strive to become much higher primates, some promising specimens are turning up just in time, like each of you here today. In their many ways, they're mobilizing society's most potent forces, businesses in mindful markets, and citizens in vibrant civil society, to do what is necessary. At this pivotal moment, the most important moment since we walked out of Africa, the moment when humanity has exactly enough time starting now. Each of you can choose to be one of those unusual people who, with humor and courage, chutzpah and humility, eager enthusiasm, and relentless patience are composing their lives and combining their efforts to make it so. Here we are. And now, imagine the power of all of us together to make it so. Hello. <clears throat> what a great privilege to speak to you today. It was a tough question for me what, what I could possibly say at a GSPP graduation. <clears throat> if I were a former secretary of a federal agency or department, maybe say like the Department of Labor, um, <laughs> I would offer you some sage advice about leadership. It would be very inspiring. If I had written a definitive text on public policy, I don't know, say, the Eightfold Path, I would share some veterans' wisdom about how to tackle really tough policy problems. Unfortunately, Bob and Jean were not available today. Sean LaGuardia, wherever you are out there, I'm sorry that Bob Reich couldn't make it. <clears throat> so you got me. Um, I'm not gonna try to exhort you to do great things, because I know you well enough to know that you're going to do that anyway, so I'm not going to waste our time on that. Instead, I'm going to tell you a story 
um, about how gloriously wonderful it is to teach, teach GSPP students, um, but also how terribly painful it can be. <laughs> the episode that I'm gonna describe occurred a decade ago, almost exactly, um, but uh, it speaks volumes about every class of GSPP students that I've ever taught. Um, <clears throat> when I came to interview for a job at GSPP 10 years ago, part of the interview had what they called a teaching demonstration part. Um, and the teaching demonstration part was you had to go in and actually teach a class to a group of GSPP students who had assembled for the purpose of your teaching demonstration. And then members of the faculty would sit and observe you and evaluate the quality of your teaching. I mean, that kind of sounds like a nightmare in itself as a job interview. Um, but in my particular case, it really sort of turned into one for reasons that I'll explain. <laughs> I went into it pretty confident. Um, when I was in graduate school uh, at Columbia, I had taught MPA students. Um, and so I kind of thought, you know I, know, I know who these people are. I know my audience. I can teach these people. I've done it before. How different could these Berkeley students be from the Columbia ones? Um, <clears throat> all I needed was some really good material, because everybody knows a good class needs some good material. Uh, it was early 2004, and the Supreme Court was about to decide the first of its Guantanamo Bay cases. Um, and so there were a lot of really important, really compelling, really interesting and complicated legal issues um, that American courts were grappling with about how they were going to deal with um, the legal status and rights of people accused of terrorist acts. My plan was to use this material for my teaching demonstration. The whole class was gonna build its way up to a grand point. Um, and the grand point was gonna be that the existing American legal framework for dealing with these issues was outmoded, was grossly, had been developed for an earlier time, was inadequate for the task at hand, and we needed new law. So that was my conclusion, we need new law. Um, and I was gonna end the class there. I had an elaborate, discussion strategy planned. I thought it was pretty smart. Uh, I knew exactly how it was gonna go. Uh, the architecture of the discussion had seven steps, exactly seven steps. Each was critical, okay? And the seventh step was gonna be my grand conclusion about American law currently being outmoded in need of change. <clears throat> I was gonna play the role of the knowledgeable teacher. I was gonna ask very subtly leading questions that we're gonna generate discussion around each building block that was necessary to bring the legal tenderfoots at GSPP along <laughs> step by step to understand this complicated legal question. They were gonna love it. <laughs> About five minutes into my teaching demonstration, when I was at the very beginning of step two, <laughs> a student in the back of the room raised her hand and her question was something like this. Isn't the problem that the legal framework you're talking about is outmoded? <laughs> it was designed for a different world than the one we live in. Isn't the real question how to change it to meet current needs? Her fellow GSPP students nodded in agreement as if the point were obvious. <laughs> so my grand conclusion, my step seven, had been snatched from me. Worse, this rendered steps two to six moot and worthless. <laughs> the faculty in the room who, who would decide whether to hire me looked on impassively, a, a little bit slack-jawed. The silence in the room felt gaping, at least to me. I was out of steps, but unfortunately, I was not out of time. <laughs> I looked at the clock in the back of the room and there were 35 minutes left in my 40 minute teaching demonstration. <laughs> at that point, the phrase teaching demonstration really did seem like the wrong one to describe what was going on. <laughs> I had 35 minutes to twist awkwardly in the wind without any material. That student's face, the one who asked the question, still sometimes hovers above me. <laughs> and haunts me in my dreams. <laughs> the first several years at GSPP, I taught every day in fear of running out of material. I came to class with twice as much material as we could possibly cover, just in case you showed up. 
But what GSPP students took away with one hand, they gave back with another. The spoilers question suggested other questions. If the law should change, how exactly should it change? How exactly should we balance the competing interests of liberty and security? What empirical basis do we have to predict the consequences of a legal change? Who had the legal authority to make change? Who had the moral authority? Now these were the kind of fundamental questions that GSPP students cared about. They sat up. One hand went up, then another, then another. The students took over. Fortunately for me, they disagreed with one another. <laughs> At first respectfully, and then not so much. <laughs> Rather than playing the shrewd Socrates, which had been my presumption, I just had to call on one raised hand after another. And before I knew it, my teaching demonstration had run over time. And the discussion had been excellent, in spite of me. I thought that maybe no one had noticed what had happened, and that I might get credit for the quality of the discussion. But afterward, Professor Jean Bardak told me with a wry smile that I shouldn't be too worried about what happened, because it is typically the case in these teaching demonstrations that job candidates grossly underestimate GSPP students. They're the best thing about this job, he told me, and about that he was surely right. So that was my painful initiation into the great pleasure and privilege of teaching what are the most prodigiously talented, interesting, and engaging students to be found anywhere. Students who seem to get better with each passing year, and abs with certainty, you guys are the best crowd that's come through yet. <laughs> So, GSPP class of 2013, keep jumping to the conclusion when it's obvious, keep seizing the big questions that get to the heart of the matter, and keep asking hard questions to people who underestimate you because they don't know you. <clears throat> They'll quickly learn just how formidable you are. Thank you for being awesome and making GSPP such a great place. Congratulations and good luck. Supposed to introduce Chris and yeah. you got that? Chris is coming. Okay. No, you're gonna do it. Okay. Do it. So next is Chris Simi, who's going to present the class gift. Hi, everybody. I will be brief. I just wanted to uh, announce that the class of 2013 has raised about $20,000 um, as a class gift. And uh, that money is going to go to a new ADA accessible door in GSPP 250, as well as scholarship funds for future students. So thank you to everybody for your incredible generosity. And with that, I'm going to uh, introduce Professor Lee Friedman, who's going to present the Outstanding GSI Awards. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Lee Friedman. I'm a professor at the school. I've been teaching the uh, core economics class for uh, a good number of years, almost 40. Um, and it's also been my privilege uh, not only to have had all of the graduating class in my core class, but to have supervised a small number of them as graduate student instructors um, when, they, when they come to their second year and then they themselves begin to teach the new incoming class. Um, it, it's my privilege to, today to ask the following three graduates-to-be to please join me on the podium to receive their awards from the Graduate Division of the University of California at Berkeley as outstanding graduate student instructors. Anna Rubin for, for, for her work in economics of the public policy analysis class, two semesters. Melanie Sheppey. <laughs> for, 
for her work in the Wealth and Poverty class and for the Introduction to Policy Analysis class. And Aleka Seville. for Aleka's work in the Wealth and Poverty class also, and in public leadership and management. Um, how does the award come about? How do these awards come about? The students and faculty of GSPP are asked to nominate those GSIs that they feel are deserving of this prestigious award. A GSPP committee consisting of the head graduate advisor, Jane Malden, our Teaching guru, Professor Michael O'Hare, and our Dean, Henry Brady, review these nominations, and they select those that they consider the most deserving and submit formal recommendations by the school to the university's graduate division. The graduate division receives such nominations from all departments on campus and decides from them the strongest nominations to receive the awards. We are very fortunate this year to have three members of our graduating class to have been selected for this honor. Well, what's the significance of it? Um, for the students that are getting their PhDs and heading for teaching careers, the value of these awards is more obvious. They are aspiring to be teachers, whereas our graduate students, those getting the masters of public policy, by and large have different aspirations, aspirations to make a difference in the world of affairs, not the world of the classroom. Nevertheless, do not overlook the drive, determination, and the hard work that our awardees put into their teaching positions because they have high standards for everything, because they would not be in these positions if they did not have some aspiration and attraction to teaching and aspirations to do their work at the highest level of excellence. Because they understand how important it is to their students, who for these awardees will include essentially every single person graduating from GSPP one year from now, because they are teaching the skills of public policy analysis and their success affects the future success of their students in actual applications. But what might go unnoticed among these reasons is how valuable the skills of communication are in the public policy profession and what these awards symbolize about the communication skills of our three recipients. To be an outstanding GSI, it is not nearly enough to know thoroughly, inside and out, the material for which you are responsible because what matters is how well you use your understanding to communicate with your students so that they will learn it, so that they will receive, comprehend, and internalize the messages that you as an instructor are conveying to them. To be an outstanding GSI, you have to be a great communicator. In the public policy profession, we are in desperate need of great communicators. It is not enough to understand substantively yourself what needs to be done and what improvements must be made. You have to convince others from many different backgrounds and circumstances of the wisdom of your proposals. I can tell you as the former economics instructor of our three awardees that they certainly know their substance. But now I can also tell you um, that, that if any of you were connected with a public policy organization with an important opening, how lucky you would be to convince any of our three awardees to work for you. Because their excellence applies not just in knowing, but in explaining to whoever needs or wants to know. In appreciation and in honor of their hard work, their achievements, and their communication skills, that are so valuable to all of us in the public policy business. I am pleased to give you, Anna, Melanie, and Aleka, the university's outstanding GSI award.
and the Union Railroad. Congratulations. Thank you all for your attention and my congratulations and best wishes to all of today's graduating class. Good morning, everyone. So uh, let's get down to business, give away some diplomas. So today we have uh, the pleasure of having four of our PhD students finish and written excellent dissertations. And each one of their advisors, I fortunately have two, this is sort of an unusual event for me, are gonna be able to say a little bit about what they've done, you'll hear from them in turn. But before we do that, I just, just wanna say, uh, let uh, everyone in the audience know what a big achievement this is. This really is to, to earn a PhD, first of all, is a I'm long- I'm gonna interrupt. We gotta do the Smolensky Award for best APA. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. We'll get back to we'll this. We'll come back, all right. You will get your diplomas. But well, we've got to do this first. Is it Dan? David Thurper's doing it. Who's doing it? We're having a committee meeting of the faculty up here right now. Just uh, wait a few moments. We'll figure this out. There's not going to be a Smolensky Award this year. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Dan Ackland will come up and do it. Is Cecile, did we do that right? No, not at all, right? You can do it right now? We are managing by muddling through. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out, okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm completely unprepared for this. Um, first part. There are actually two prizes this year for the Smolensky Prize for Outstanding Advanced Policy Analysis. Unbeknownst to him, David Kerp is going to be presenting one of them. Um, and he's supposed to be presenting it before me, but that's, that would be awkward, I think, at this stage. <laughs> so I will present mine first, and then I will introduce David. Um, and you already introduced me, so we're done with that. Right. Okay. Now I'm going to start reading my notes. So uh, my notes say that it's a pleasure to present this prize to one student in particular, and that is true, and I'll get to that. But first, I just want to say what a pleasure it has been to work with all of my students this semester. Uh, you are looking at some amazing students here, and it is a tremendous pleasure to work with all of them. And please don't tell the dean this, but I would do it for free. <laughs> and with that, it is my special pleasure to present, my notes say the second, but in fact it's the first, Smolensky Prize for Outstanding Advanced Policy Analysis to Tommy Drake. Tommy's APA was entitled, now you have to pay careful attention here, Actions to Address Expired Marina Concession Contracts at Lake Mead National Recreation Area, and was conducted for the National Park Service. Tommy figured out that the main reason the Park Service is having such a hard time finding concessionaires for its marinas is because it refuses to allow enough managerial flexibility to make it possible for entrepreneurs to turn a profit. Now, if that sounds like something you could have figured out yourself, talk to me after the ceremony and I'll show you the least squares regression analysis Tommy did to estimate the profit function of an NPS marina concessionaire. As far as I can make out, Tommy used every single tool in his GSPP toolkit during his APA and he hit the nail on the head. In addition, though this is not a consideration in the selection process, Tommy stood out as one of the most attentive and helpful members of our APA group and I feel certain that his helpfulness was appreciated by everyone in the group. Tommy, congratulations on a job very well done.
And now it's my pleasure to introduce David Kirk and basically throw him under the bus. If any of you were told that this is a Hamish, informal, friendly, warm, spontaneous graduation, you know, here's exhibit number one. Um, I learned about 10 seconds ago uh, that Craig Boschman has, is the winner, second winner of the Eugene Smolensky Award for Advanced Policy Analysis. So if I'd been prepared, I would have worn one of Craig's patented t-shirts or hoodies, but I'm proud to say that I, have, I think I own everything that he has produced, and if he doesn't have a career as a great policy analysis analyst, which he does, it's a second career as a great sort of entrepreneur in sort of the design of products for the school and other places. Um, I've, I've taught APA um, for a very long time, and it's really an exciting thing to do because the students are amazing, the dynamic is fantastic, um, and as a professor, you learn about an array of subjects that you knew nothing about and maybe beforehand you cared nothing about. Um, but the students bring them to life. This year's APA section was fabulous, uh, particularly great. Um, if, this is the, if this is the best GSPP class ever, I think I can say this is the best APA class forever. And, and when I assign grades to students, I said, either I'm getting senile and too cheerful in my estimation, of, too hopeful, I guess is the word, too optimistic in my appraisal of your work, or you really are the best group that I've ever had. So bravo to the entire class. Um, and to Craig, who was both a great contributor to the class and who did really the model, the essence, the quintessential Goldman School APA. The title, a little bit shorter than Tommy's, The Future of San Francisco's Public Electric Vehicle chargers. So what does that mean? San Francisco wants a world that sounds like the world that Amory Lovins was describing, one in which more people are driving electric cars, which do much less damage to the environment. And so it has, as part of its effort to encourage that, installed electric chargers in garages throughout the city. That costs money. So the question that Craig was addressing is what pricing policy should the city adopt as it expands the number of chargers to anticipate the increased demand for them? Well, it's a great question, and it involves projecting all sorts of things. How many people are going to buy electric cars? How many people will drive into the city? How will the demand be affected by what the pricing structure is? What's fair? Some cars stay in the charger station all day. You know, hogging it because somebody is off working and they do that. Some cars require a bigger charge than others. Do we want to make this a free good so that everybody is able to have access to these? And we are really going to encourage, we're going to put our money where our mouth is as a city. That's the analytic part of this. But Craig also addressed the other question, which is integral to public policy, which is, so what, what are the political consequences of the choice we make? And it's not, the policy is good. We don't do the analytics and then say, okay, we've got this awful political system. Let's figure out what we can get away with. We really believe that politics matters in important ways. So it factors into the analysis. And what Craig did is a fabulous piece of work, and I'm delighted to learn five minutes ago that he is the most deserving of the second Smolensky Prize. Congratulations, Craig. <laughs> Me again. I don't think that there's any more fitting ending experience for a PhD student than to have to wait a couple extra minutes for you. Yeah, so <laughs> so uh, we have four excellent, excellent PhD students that are, are finishing today. And before we, before we hear about each one, I just really want to mark the fact that this is an incredible achievement, that all of these students have been working here for years. 
They have uh, toiled through very, very difficult coursework. They've been tasked with generating new knowledge about a you know, topic that's important and that's been written a lot about and opined about, and to do in a way that is not so esoteric as it might be in other departments, but that has general applicability and actionable findings. And all of these students have risen to that challenge and they've done a great job. So it's a, it's a real honor to be here to be able to um, to be able to, to hood them and to participate in the process of the completion of their PhD dissertation. So the first person I'd like to call up uh, it is, my, um, is Aaron Chalfin. Aaron, please come to the stage. So uh, how many people in the audience have read Moneyball or seen the movie Moneyball, the, the book? Okay, so. Aaron, Moneyball is a book about uh, the, the manager of the Oakland Athletics, our, our local team, that applied statistics to baseball and came up with better ways to sort of win games on a low budget by using basically knowledge and research and smarts. So Aaron is the Billy Bean of crime statistics, right, of, of doing criminological research. He has uh, written on a number of topics in various aspects of policing, corrections, uh, punishment, um, investigatory tools. I'll talk about two of the things that he's worked on. Uh, in his dissertation, he's done um, what will probably be one of the most cited studies on the effects of higher policing levels on crime that is based on uh, an analysis of city level data covering 35 years and has a, a sort of really cool technical innovation that I'm not going to describe, but it's something that has already generated a lot of uh, um, accolades within the academic community. And in addition, uh, aside from academics, it's a paper that's being discussed actively in police departments uh, across the country, and especially uh, here in California, where uh, the police are facing new challenges associated with very low staffing levels. So it's quite a big achievement. Uh, another paper in his dissertation looks specifically at the issue of um, the relationship between the presence of unauthorized uh, immigrants in communities and crime rates. So for, for those who follow immigration reform um, and immigration debates, over the last 10 years or so, a number of states have taken it upon themselves to pass very punitive legislation targeting unauthorized immigrants, largely uh, based on contentions regarding the impact of unauthorized immigrants on, on the local economy, but also based on the contention that unauthorized immigrants uh, augment crime. So Aaron has an incredibly innovative study where essentially um, he uncovered the fact that when there are extreme weather events in rural Mexico, like too much rain, not enough rain, that that tends to propel uh, more unauthorized immigrants into cities that are traditional destinations for, uh, for, those, for those immigrants in the past. And he exploits this to essentially try to rigorously evaluate this claim that uh, has been um, the source of much political heat and immigration debate and quite decisively shows absolutely no relationship between additional unauthorized immigrants and, and crime in the cities. It's an excellent study and it's already being cited and it's probably figuring into a lot of the sea change in what we've seen in terms of uh, the politics surrounding immigration. So it's, it's a fantastic accomplishment. Aaron has a job. He'll be a, a, yeah. And if I ever stop talking, he'll have his PhD. But he's uh, going to be an assistant professor of criminology at the University of Cincinnati, and he's starting in the fall. So I'm, I'm incredibly proud of him. So Aaron, please come to the podium. Okay. All right, so take on. Okay, so hang out for one second. It is my pleasure to confer upon Aaron Chalfin the Doctorate of Philosophy degree in Public Policy. All right, moving right along. So Ho Song Sun, would you please come to the stage? So if Aaron's the Billy Bean of crime research, Ho Sung is the Billy Bean of education research. So a, another, another uh, um, very strong PhD student. Um, Ho Sung has written an incredible dissertation uh, that, that um, is 
uh, innovative on so many levels, studying various aspects of education policy in Seoul, South Korea, uh, that informs all sorts of questions that are actually quite relevant to uh, many of the education debates that occur within the United States. So I'll, I'll talk about two of the contributions in his dissertation. There's, there's an ongoing debate uh, in education circles regarding gender segregated education and whether or not students do better when they're, they're with their own gender, especially uh, um, young women. And there's quite a bit of speculation, usually based on personal testimony and, uh, and non-experimental, just, just comparisons of people who attend gender segregated schools for people who attend mixed schools, that suggest that women uh, or young girls indeed do better when they're in, uh, when they're in sex segregated schools. However, one could very easily come up with a number of reasons why you might question that finding, namely those uh, parents who are you know, going out of their way to put their kids in a private school and put their kids in a, in a gender segregated uh, situation might just be more motivated, might spend more time in education and so on and so forth. And so we never really know what the real effect is. And there's not a lot of good research on this question, but a lot of discussion of this issue. So Ho Sung found an amazing quirk in uh, the way students are assigned in Seoul, South Korea. And that's namely in most of the neighborhoods of the city, when you hit the high school age, you're randomly assigned to schools, okay? And the, very different than the way we do things in the United States. So there's no neighborhood schools. You're essentially within a district. You're randomly assigned to a high school. And the motivation for doing that is to make sure that if you randomly assigned all the students, there'd be strong balance across schools in the ability of the kids. So you'd have some smart kids, some kids who need extra help, and all the schools would start from the same uh, starting point. Now for his purposes, that was great because some of the high schools in Seoul, South Korea are Seoul sex. They have all male high schools, all female high schools, as well as some high schools that are not 50-50. And he exploits this fact and assesses how students do uh, on the college entrance exam, which everyone has to take. And Lo and behold, uh, Ho Sung finds quite strong evidence that, that students in gender segregated schools do somewhat better than students in mixed uh, education schools. Now, they might feel differently about it, right? But in the end, when you look at the scores, it's undeniable it's there. It's a great study, and it, it really is another, it's a great accomplishment. One more uh, uh, piece of research from his dissertation. Ho Sung has also done some very interesting research on the effects of compensatory financing on student achievement. And in the, so for example, currently in California, Jerry Brown is proposing uh, to reserve a certain amount of education fundings for students or for, for districts that are the poorest and have the lowest test scores with an eye on trying to remediate some of the inequality in access to education that occurs in this state and that occurs in other states across the country. In, in Seoul, there's actually a funding mechanism that when students' performance falls below a certain threshold, there's a compensatory grant that's given to those low-performing low uh, schools with an eye on trying to improve uh, the performance of those schools. And, and using a, a very kind of cool statistical technique, Ho Sung uh, exploits that fact to essentially address this question, what happens when you give more resources to a lower-performing school? And lo and behold, he finds that you know, rather than the money being wasted, you can find quite appreciable increases in the performance of the students in those schools, suggesting that that precisely is what we might want to do, right? And so it's very relevant to what we do. Great dissertation. Ho Sung has a very bright future ahead of him. Uh, and in the coming year, he's going to be a postdoctoral scholar here at UC Berkeley. So Ho Sung, please come to the stage. Don't leave yet. So it is my pleasure to confer upon Ho Sung Son the Doctor of Philosophy degree in Public Policy. Okay. So I'm Rucker Johnson, I'm an economist and professor here in the school, and I want to call to the stage Sarah Martin Anderson. I As, a look, as I look out and see her beautiful family and kids taking pictures, I, I just want to say that um, I've had the distinct honor of serving as her dissertation advisor, and um, certainly uh, Jesse Rothstein has served on her dissertation committee and worked closely with her in, in the last several years. But before she entered our doctoral program, she first joined GSVP 
as an MPP student. And I had her in class, and she was outstanding. And I encouraged her to apply to the doctoral program. And she went on to, to apply. And along the way, she earned her both her MPP and MPH. Um, but I've kind of seen the involvement of both her research interests that really center on how um, early life factors shape subsequent child development and well-being. And so she's broadly interested in how and evaluating the impacts of social and health policies and government programs that are targeted at for children from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds um, to address sources of health disparities that are rooted in early life conditions. Um, her, Sarah's dissertation research is focused on prenatal, the perinatal, and early infancy and the effects of policies aimed at that time period in life. Um, and so when I see her kids out there, I just think about the dedication of her research uh, portfolio is really aimed at the importance of early child education. That is, when we think about early child education, but early child um, from conception through age five, it's a particularly important time for policy interventions to attempt to increase social mobility. Um, in part because a good deal of inequality uh, is apparent by the time children start school, and because children's development may be more malleable during this critical, uh, sensitive stage of rapid growth. And so while a doctoral student in our program, Sarah has taken an ambitious set of coursework uh, to provide the quantitative and theoretic foundations from departments across the campus to ensure that she's a really well-trained researcher and scholar of issues related to maternal, child, and reproductive health. Um, one of her central themes throughout her dissertation is investigating the determinants and consequences of breastfeeding for children and their mothers. And there's an extensive body of research that's looked at the short-term and long-term benefits of breastfeeding for children and mothers, and has generally found that it's been associated with a strong association with physiological benefits that promote healthy uh, cognitive development. And so based on those results, the, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends six months of exclusive breastfeeding. And what perplexed Sarah in part with her research is that while that's true, many demographic groups far, far away from those recommended benchmarks. So what she went proactively to do is identify rich data sets that have longitudinal data that spans conception to uh, for mothers and children from pregnancy to 15 to 24 months. And she really exhibits the kind of intellectual, um, entrepreneurial spirit that we all really aspire to be and do um, in the way that she spearheaded a collaboration with neonatologist and professor Dr. Henry Lee. Um, and in that collaboration through her work with UCSF and the state of California, she obtained remarkable data uh, for her dissertation research. Effectively, 90% of all neonatal intensive care unit uh, births in California over the course of 2003 to 2007, this hospital data includes over 70,000 births. And um, actually, my son is in her data. But anyways, <laughs> that's an aside. Um, the point is that the, the majority of research on the effects of breastfeeding um, in the neonatal intensive care unit relies on observation of uh, data using comparing uh, infants that were breastfed versus those who weren't. And typically, those kinds of studies have shown a positive association between breast milk feeding and health outcomes. But what remained unclear in that kind of work is, is it really the breastfeeding behavior on the part of mothers or some pre-existing differences between mothers and children of those who are breastfed versus formula fed? So how she tackled this um, in a very different way than what had typically been done. The idea for her approach occurred to her while interviewing clinicians in the neonatal intensive care unit with her work with USCSF, where she, what she noticed is patterns emergent in the data that mothers were frustrated with the less experienced nurses and technicians who often worked the night shift and did not encourage mothers to breastfeed. So if you went into labor on the night shift, based on those insights, she hypothesized that women who gave birth um, on the night shift would be less likely than women who gave birth on the day shift to breastfeed. And so what she then does is analyzes the influence of hour of birth um, to try to analyze its impacts on a variety of infant health outcomes where hour of birth matters insofar as it influences the likelihood of breastfeeding, nurse staffer ratios, the quality of care, and then looks at 
the impacts on the incidence of specific health conditions um, in infants. And that work has resulted in two uh, leading publications in a, a medical journal, Breastfeeding, with neonatologist Henry Lee, which investigates key factors in promoting breastfeeding and skin-to-skin -skin care contact between mothers and newborn infants. And what's key about her work is it combines both quantitative and qualitative analyses to tr try to really get inside the, the black box of how is this potentially having an impact. And her other work has been recently uh, published in the Social Science and Medicine, and that work really looks at how um, the federal nutrition program, the largest federal nutrition program, the WIC program for pregnant women, how it impacts the likelihood of initiating and continuing breastfeeding as well as other nutrition uh, dimensions. And I just want to say in closing, you know, while a doctor or student in our program, she's really made a name for herself beyond the, the ex remarkable research productivity. But while doing that, at the same time, she has been an incredible teaching resource. Bob Rice, Steve Raphael, Jack Glazer, many students know her as the super GSI. Um, and as the multitasking master, the mother of comedy. And we can all attest that she's one of the top GSPP talent show performers, <laughs> AKA the dancing machine. But most of all, she embodies the core values of public service that we at GSPP highly prize and are dedicated to live out in the classroom and in our communities. And so I'm very pleased to announce that she'll continue to make her impact on students and research as she steps into her new role as assistant professor at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, where she'll be joining the faculty in the business school as well as a secondary appointment in the medical school. So it's with my distinct honor to confer the Doctor of Philosophy degree in public policy to share my name. Good morning. I'm Jane Malden, and it is my pleasure to invite Erica Weisinger to the stage to receive her degree. <laughs> Erica came to us with a BA from Pomona and a Master's in Public Policy Studies from Johns Hopkins, and she brought with her a profound passion and intellectual curiosity about how to make the public agencies that serve our most vulnerable work better. She has worked, in fact, for many years as part of a team working with um, the D District of Columbia Department of Child and Family Services to improve their foster care system to uh, the extent that they will be able to move, or have already actually moved out of federal receivership. This was very important work, and it informed her intellectual studies, uh, which have then led to the theme of her dissertation work. Along the way, while she was here, she received an Eigert Fellowship and she received a dissertation award for the Center for Child and Family Studies at the University of California. Um, she took very seriously the fact that there are about 100,000 children in foster care who have been identified as eligible for adoption, have been in foster care for a number of years, and yet these 100,000 children are not yet adopted. Um, on an annual basis, there are a lot of adoptions, and yet there remains this large stock that changes over time, but one would wish to work out ways to improve and to speed up the adoption process for these children. And having worked in the, in the field, she was well aware of this. And what she saw and what she chose to study was the very different perspectives uh, on, held by people who seek to adopt and people who run the agencies who, who screen and train and ultimately approve the adoption uh, itself. 
Um, the first group is very numerous, in fact. About two million women every year, it seems, uh, have uh, applied or inquired about the possibility of adoption in some way in their lives. They, we know this from survey data. So it's a very common thing that people are interested in learning about adoption and consider it some way for themselves. And yet, um, on the other hand, as I said, there are a lot of children in foster care. And from the adoption agency's standpoint, they have what we uh, can theorize, if you like, as a principal agent problem. And one of Erica's important contributions in her work has been to apply theoretical tools, perhaps that we have especially in economics or in political theory, to a, a domain which often is not studied really from a theoretical standpoint, but more from a kind of just more descriptive or, or compassionate standpoint, certainly. But it's uh, the application of this question of a principal agent analysis that I think is one of the contributions, because what she said is, well, the agency is trying to find foster parents and ultimately adoptive parents who will stand in for the role the state is presently taking, which is that the state has declared that the birth parents are not eligible to be parents, and so the state has taken on that role of parenting. Well, they are in this intermediate position, and as a good intermediary, they are not willing to hand over that responsibility without really, 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 really being sure that the people to whom they are entrusting these children are going to do a good job with it. But of course, on the other side of that, come so they are very aware of the costs of getting it wrong. And every once in a while, we have appalling stories of placements that fail in ways that are extremely harmful. So there's a very evident risk of failure. And yet the risks of not managing to move the process along in a timely way, the risks that are in fact experienced in a kind of chronic problem of persistence not having a family among children are in a way less salient. They certainly don't make the headlines and in a way they, they just are not seen as important as the problem of screening out inappropriate parents. And in the process of, of this lengthy process of, of, of recruiting and screening, the, um, not only do children stay in foster care longer than perhaps they need, but parents who would otherwise be willing to adopt lose heart. Their circumstances change. Uh, they may, in fact, lose some of the eligibility criteria. Maybe their income goes down. Maybe they move beyond a certain age threshold. And yet, of course, had they already had a child, as we all know, if you have a child and your income goes down, well, you figure it out. And if you get older, well, in fact, the truth of the matter is we all get older, so that's just the way it happens. So life happens, and it can remove from the pool eligible people. And Erica saw all of this kind of from the outside, and she wanted to go in and through very detailed qualitative interviewing with agency staff and with prospective, in fact, turned away or disillusioned or discouraged parents for the most part, although she did also interview successful adoptive parents, to understand exactly how it is that these different agendas play out in ways that ultimately are not optimal at all for uh, children and for prospective parents. And so I am just thrilled to have worked with her in this project and to have seen it come to a really wonderful fruition in a in a very persuasive and interesting dissertation. And I am uh, looking forward to seeing the work moving into the professional and, and scholarly literature so it will help these agencies really get a better handle on how to improve and, and uh, manage the different considerations more explicitly attending to the costs and the, the hardships of having a very extended uh, adoptive process. So with that, I am just delighted to uh, confer on Erica Weisinger the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Public Policy. Now you turn around and face. And now we will begin the presentation of the Master of Public Policy degrees. <laughs> uh, 
Alex Guinness. Andrew Keikoa Abordinado. Walter Angeles Abrazaldo. Linda Melody Alves. Holly Klein Axe. Jeffrey Edward Belisario. Sarah Benjamin. Sheila Barucha. Craig Patrick Bosman. Joanne L. Brook. Amanda Casimir Brown. Aaron Taylor Burgess. Psyche Tsai. Amanda Charbonneau. Florence Hoyling Chen. <laughs> Tiffany Simone Clark. <laughs> Connor Patrick Cole. <laughs> Rita Ann, <laughs> Rita Ann Kukovic. Vijay Das. Sahar Direction. Sheetal Durr. Anissa Dockerty. Thomas Drake. <laughs> Jocelyn Anna Everode. <laughs> Matt Fedenke. <laughs> Mary Catherine Fitzpatrick. Katie Fleming. Evan Gallagher. Zachary Goldman. Greg W. Gonzalez. Sarah Fox Hansen. Mikhail Haramati. Eileen Hayes. Chris.
Christopher James Howard. <laughs> Matthias Jaime. <laughs> Ankith Jane. <laughs> Shelly Jiang. Dion Jida Chaikiti. Anna Maureen Johnson. Charlotte Jordane Martinez. Janine Kaiser. Hida Khan. <laughs> Allison Frank Klerfeld. <laughs> Alina Koch Lawrence. <laughs> Sean Lansong LaGuardia. Victor Lamond. Christina Lee. Andrew M. Lomelli. Tammy Liu. Benjamin Mandel. Latoya I. McDonald. Alejandra Mejia. Isaac Menashe. Catherine Rose Harrison Murtha. <laughs> Jamil Nukvi. <laughs> Alexi Painter. Lynn Paprocki. Jason Timothy Perkins. Luke Reidenbach. Valerie Fennick Rosenberg. Anna Elise Rubin. <laughs> Nimith Ruparel. <laughs> Sarah Allison Salter. <laughs> Jacob Oliver Shack. Melanie Sheppy. Oh. Aleka Niedermeyer Seville. Oh. TJ Sheehy. Oh. Oh. 
Hadamuchi Jamizu. Jennifer Lynn Ship. Megan Elizabeth Seams. Christopher John Seamy. Sally Catherine Breasted Smith. Jean Spencer. Jonathan Stein. Carrie Tam. Sujit Narayan Singh Tapa. Orville Pascal Thomas. Sarah Michelle Thomason. Preethi Jayanth Trevetti. Candace Marie Valsing. Brianna Elise Van Erp. Lisa M. White. Well, congratulations to everybody. Let, let me also just turn and thank the faculty who, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I know as a faculty member myself, this is the day you just sit there so happy and so proud and, and so glad, uh, happy, proud, and glad that uh, things have, have come to this and that we've, we've gotten another class graduated uh, with such distinction, and it's truly thrilling. It really, it's just a wonderful day. So, with that said, I'll, I'll do the one thing for which I have real authority, and that is, please stand, graduates. And it is my pleasure to confer these degrees upon the class of 2013 by virtue of the authority vested in me by the president and regents of the University of California, I grant you this degree from the Goldman School of public policy. Congratulations. So everybody is invited to join us for a reception at 2607 Hearst at the Goldman School. Hope to see you there in a few minutes. It's an easy walk down the street, so please join us there. And this concludes our commencement. Thank you.